Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, April 9th. Looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean, we see a small gale off the Pacific Northwest generating 20-foot seas aimed at the U.S. West Coast, uh, probably producing some sort of small swell. Another system over the northern Dateline region producing 22-foot seas, and maybe yet a third system trying to organize off of North Japan. Let's dive into the details. As usual, we'll start out looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales. When those gales do form, help direct their track. What we're looking for is troughs, that is a little dip in the jet stream, like right there north of Japan, and also right there off the U.S. west coast. That, of course, helps form a counterclockwise circulation aloft and down at the surface. That is the hallmark of low pressure, and a low pressure, of course, generates wind. Winds generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, produces swell, and swell, when it hits your beach, produces surf. So, two areas of interest. A little trough here. Not a whole lot of wind energy associated with it. What is that? Oh, 120 knot winds. Another system off Japan. And almost one could say there's a little area of low pressure here. That's sort of trying to form a little hook there. So maybe a trough in the western gulf supported by 130 knot winds. More wind energy pushing down into the trough. The better of odds of some sort of circulation forming. But also notice the jet is split here from Japan all the way to almost a point north of Hawaii. But still, decent wind energy persists, so therefore storm formation is possible. Anyway, roll this out. We see this little trough here in the Gulf moving onshore into Washington on Monday. But yet the backup trough that was over the northern dateline starts moving into the Gulf on Monday. And the system that was north of Japan is uh, starting to evolve. We'll roll this out. And then we see sort of this amplified pattern, the split right here, uh, just uh, northwest of Hawaii, well split, the northern end of the jet moving up into the Gulf of Alaska, then falling back down. Good support for gale formation here. Definitely, that's a trough. And also, the trough that was off Japan continues to evolve as it moves to the east into Tuesday. And this pattern just sort of continues into Wednesday. Uh, but notice the jet, as uh, or the, I'm sorry, the trough that was pushing over the northern Dateline region is now getting pinched off, no longer productive. But the Gulf gale, or Gulf trough, continues to evolve, moving slowly closer to the coast. Also notice wind energy building off of Japan. The jet, now notice you can't really see it, but certainly there's an assumption that this split point is still here somewhere around the date line. But maybe that too is starting to fade. We continue into Thursday, low pressure continues in the Gulf, new trough developing off the Kurils, supportive of gale formation. Gosh, look at this. Still into Saturday. This is almost a week of having a trough here just locked over the Gulf of Alaska, the eastern Gulf. Wind energy building, pulling the jet more together, pushing the split, split point, basically almost wiping it out come Friday night, and we'll get into the weekend. Trough still continues here a week out on Sunday off the U.S. West Coast, and the jet Looking reasonably uh, cohesive uh, across the rest of the Pacific. We'll just roll this out in. Whoops, into Monday. There we go, 6C. Still low pressure in the Gulf. Not a whole lot changes. The split pretty much dissipates. A reasonably productive pattern is indicated. Next up, we take a look at surface level pressure, surface level winds down. What's actually going on on the surface? Low pressure as expected in the eastern Gulf of Alaska. But notice the trough that was here wasn't real strong, and the low pressure system associated with it also isn't strong. Barely 30 knot winds off of, uh, eh, what is that, South Oregon, not super productive. The system that we think is trying to organize here over the na northern dateline, 25 knot winds, not that's not a whole lot either. And the new system off Japan, small area, 35 knot winds, nothing super impressive going on here. We'll just roll this out until we get into Monday, 18C. That's about 11 o'clock uh, a.m. West Coast time. 45 knot winds developing, moving towards the dateline. That's something worth keeping an eye on. That continues 40 knot winds into Tuesday and then starting to fade out. Another system right behind it. Also notice low pressure here developing off of California. Perhaps not so much a swell producer, but yet maybe more precipitation, maybe more snow in the Sierra. 
Uh, the, <laughs> the beat goes on. The system, it's like a machine. It just doesn't stop. Weaker, not as strong as it was in January, February, and early March. But still, uh, interesting weather pattern locally for California. Anyway, another system as we get into Wednesday night. Trying to organize over the Creel Islands, but pretty much landlocked. Not a whole lot going on there. High pressure moves into the U.S. West Coast come Friday. Dries things out a little bit. And then we get into the weekend. We see high pressure here. We also see low pressure north of it, but not a lot of a gradient, not a whole lot wind-wise. Also notice some sort of a tropical system suggested here off the Philippines. Never believe that on a model this far out in the future. And then we get into a week out. And basically all we're seeing is strong high pressure, weak low pressure. Um, not So what you see at the surface is not nearly as... Uh, compelling as what we saw looking at the jet stream and that's pretty normal come this time of year the more closer to summer you get the jet stream might still look good but there's just not the temperature dynamics in play and you just don't get the storm formation that you would expect given the jet stream pattern if it were uh, november december january let's say late fall early winter and that's pretty much what's going on here the season is winding down it trumps whatever's going on in the jet stream and the storm pattern just kind of starts falling apart. And that appears to be what's going on by looking at the model. So then finally, we take a look at the effect of those winds on the ocean surface. We know 20-foot seas are projected. This is a projection. Again, this isn't reality. It's not a satellite. It's just a model. But best guess is 20-foot seas here right now pushing towards the U.S. West Coast. That's good for small 13-second period swell, maybe in a yeah, give it two days or so at the most. Uh, other system here, as we saw, 22-foot seas over the northern Dateline, maybe dribbles for Hawaii, U.S. West Coast, but pretty far away from either, not aimed optimally. And then that's kind of it right now. We'll roll this out. We see both these uh, these two systems fade out. We know that winds start building here, uh, moving off of Japan in this system, moving towards the north Dateline, 30-foot seas by Monday sometime, 32-foot seas into Monday night, and then fading out from 28-foot seas. But still, that's good for probably some yeah, 16-period swell towards both the U.S. West Coast and Hawaii. Also notice, come Wednesday, New Gale starts trying to organize off the U.S. West Coast, 20-foot seas, maybe some 13-second period swell, and then something trying to get going here off Japan. But we already know pretty much that's not going a whole lot of anywhere. Good seas here, 33-foot seas, but not moving to the east Pretty much landlocked here right off the Kurils. Still, small swells possible, mainly for Hawaii, would be the guess. And then that system just dissipates, moving towards the Bering Sea. And that's the end of that. Things we saw from looking at the surface level chart, also notice this over here, uh, something possibly for the Philippines. Anyway, uh, looking at surface charts, whatever's going to happen, limited to this area, Pretty weak, mainly wind. Whoops, mainly wind swell, and that's pretty much what we're seeing on the charts here. Nothing, not even 20 foot seas. So some swell is possible. Looks like it's being generated right now off the U.S. West Coast, and some later on in the week, midweek, but nothing spectacular. We'll do a quick, quick look at the southern hemisphere. We're going back a week. This is Sunday, uh, April 2nd. A week ago, there was a gale in the central South Pacific, produced 28 foot seas pushing pretty well to the north and northeast, but faded out. Um, certainly some swell from that should be imminent. Also, we roll this out, we'll just sort of go through the week. Another gale developed under New Zealand on Friday. Small area of 38-foot seas, building a little bit into, uh, we'll say, uh, Friday midday. Pretty solid fetch area, most of it aimed to the east, some to the northeast. Probably, uh, eh, maybe a little bit of energy for why. Probably most of the focus, though, here is on Peru in that area. This system dissipated and quickly died. Then we'll look for the next week what's on the charts. The belief is there's yet another small gale forecast under New Zealand, 32-foot seas by Tuesday night, traversing the South Pacific. And notice, lifting gently to the northeast uh, and holding together pretty well. Uh, what is that? At its peak, we saw it right there, all uh, 39 foot seas. So certainly some longer periods, set small, and this isn't a big fetch area, not aimed very well to the northeast, more to the east-northeast, again, targeting, let's say, Central America, Peru, that area. But still, some swell could result, again, 
a little bit far out for the mo oops a little bit far out for the models but still you never know and then that is it then a quick inspection on precipitation uh, relative to the Sierra and snow forecast a little bit of a weather system moving in Monday main, mainly for extreme northern California not even anything expected down into Tahoe. Low pressure, local low. We saw this. There's supposed to be some seas generated with this, but also some precipitation starting Tuesday into uh, north and central California. Kind of warm temperatures. Nothing really making it to the Sierras until, oh, Thursday morning or so. Pretty good amount of... Uh, it looks like snow in the higher elevations, not a whole lot, but just a modest producer. Then after that, looks like another small low come maybe Thursday, but it disintegrates, maybe a dusting of snow for the Sierra. Let's take a look at the GFS model for Ta Tahoe. Here it is. We're going right to 11 a.m. Tuesday. Dusting of snow starting by the evening, kind of just not even an inch of accumulation so basically snow showers and then come uh, Wednesday night actual precipitation uh, snow type precipitation moves in pretty nice little dose on Thursday but then fading out and by Friday dry we're looking at eh, a foot maybe 14 or 15 inches max uh, and then things dry out. We'll just roll this out because there's another little dusting supposedly forecast by Sunday evening, maybe into Monday morning, put another three inches on that or so, and then that's it. So theoretically, uh, 15 inches, maybe 16 inches if you're lucky. Um, through Tuesday, not this Tuesday, a week out from Tuesday. Odds of that happening, very, very small at this early date and time. Probably the Wednesday-Thursday system is the one to keep your eyes on for right now. And also, just a quick look at winds relative to why light winds building into trades Tuesday in the eh, 10 to 15 knot range and not a whole lot more than that expected. Pretty much a seasonal sort of pattern for the next week. Let's look longer term into the future. Let's see what the Madden Julian Oscillation is doing and the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. Relative to the MJO, we like to look at for signs of the active phase of the MJO, and when the MJO goes active, of course, that tends to help uh, feed the jet stream, which in turn feeds the storm track, which in turn gen generates uh, sometimes swell. But given that we're, and that's mainly in the winter months, mainly in the Gulf of Alaska and Dateline region, we're past the winter, we're moving into spring, the effects of the MJO are not so pronounced anymore. But we still like to watch the MJO also because if it's strong enough and lasts long enough, then that's an indicator that perhaps El Nino is developing. So the two, the MJO and the ENSO, are interrelated or can be interrelated and can support each other. Anyway, looking across the equatorial Pacific and mainly the Kelvin Wave Generation area, that area from about 170 west, which would be a bit, uh, what would that be, southwest of Hawaii, uh, all the way over, here's New Guinea, so to almost the Philippines, five degrees north and south of the equator, we see trades in control, maybe a little bit weaker in the far west Pacific. Looking at anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year, we see, yeah, weak easterly anomalies, nothing too noticeable in the Kelvin Wave Generation area. Also here off of, uh, in the uh, far east equatorial Pacific, Kind of a neutral pattern, maybe slight northerly anomalies, if anything. So that is not a clear indicator at all of the active phase of the MJO. Uh, just, if anything, sort of similar to what's been going on for the past several weeks, but not as strong of a pattern, suggesting La Nino or the remnants of it in the atmosphere are still somewhat in control. Looking at zonal wind anomaly forecasts, that is, what's the wind in the Kelvin Wave Generation Area going to be doing? for the next week. Looking at past history, here's the date line. So basically from here, 120 east, so a little bit from there to about here, you look between those tick marks. If you see this purple 
and blue. That suggests easterly anomalies, and that's this is looking back in time. So March, you see, this is basically the uh, inactive phase of the MJO, or at least La Nina in control. But then, uh, starting oh late in March, early April, started seeing signs of weaknesses in both the MJO and La Nina. And right now, here's where we are, just a little bit of easterly anomalies, not even a trivia, just mainly the last little bits of La Nina. But the more important part here, these yellow anomalies, oranges, are westerly anomalies. Now, they're mainly confined to the far west Pacific. We want to see them get to 180. But you notice here, when we get to, what is that, three or four days out, let's say the 13th of April, 12th, 13th of April, then it looks like even La Nina is supposed to die out, according to this, and some sort of westerly anomalies starting, or at least a neutral pattern, starting to set up over the Kelvin wave generation area. And we really need that because you can just see this prevalence of easterly anomalies all associated with La Nina, been in control for quite a while. Um, it's the last gasp, we believe, of La Nina, uh, clearly in the ocean, and you've seen this in past reports, the any effects of La Nina in the ocean are all but gone now. So we've been waiting for the atmosphere to make the turn. It takes a while. It started in the ocean around January 20th, and now we're looking at almost three months later, April April 14th, April 20th, close enough, that finally the atmosphere might be getting the sense that, hey, La Nina's not here anymore. I need to reconfigure myself. So we'll see if that actually happens. But the models are suggesting the near-term models are suggesting that, in fact, that might be the case. Looking at the MJO models, outgoing long-wave radiation, one, uh, one way to view the inactive or active phase of the MJO. Right now, there is some suggestions of very weak indicators of the active phase of the MJO, blue meaning more cloud cover, less sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface, meaning lower pressure, meaning, the, of course, the active phase, the MJO. But then you look down at the forecast, and it kind of looks, basically, the whole thing looks like a neutral pattern per this, the statistic model. Now, if we go look at the dynamic model, it suggests that, yes, the active phase of the MJO is in place, and if anything, it's supposed to build, not strong, but at least modestly over the next two weeks, while the inactive phase of the MJO sets up in the Indian Ocean and in turn builds as well. Of course, the preference is for this outcome here because the active phase of the MJO, of course, helps fuel the jet stream. The jet stream helps fuel storm development, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at phase diagram projections, another way of basically looking at what we saw before, but looking down on the North Pole, the MJO, the active phase, moves, of course, west to east from the Indian Ocean, off over the Maritime Continent, West Pacific, uh, under the U.S., across the Atlantic, and back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot right there is where the active phase of the MJO is. So according to this, it's in the West Pacific, but if it's inside the circle, it's considered extremely weak. The further, if it was out here, it would be very strong. So here's where it is right now in the West Pacific. Forecast is for it to retrograde a little bit, bounce around for a couple days, stay weak, and then slowly ease to the east. The uh, GEFS model basically suggests the same thing, but only a little bit stronger. Almost a sense that a normal MJO pattern is starting to uh, develop again. This would be expected with La Nina fading out, because La Nina, again, tends to tends to mute the active phase of the MJO or dampen it and tends to favor the inactive phase. But if the uh, uh, La Nina is dying out, then the active phase will get more strength and the inactive phase of the MJO will start, will have to, uh, it will uh, um, uh, destructively interfere with it, not be as strong. And then finally, our favorite model, the CFS model, looking at 850 millibar wind anomalies. So here's the current forecast, the, the, few, uh, the current uh, state of the oceans, future to, the, to uh, the upper part of the chart, past, lower. Here's where we are, Kelvin wave generation area, roughly right in here. We see weak east anomalies expected to be gone in about three days. And then this sort of building westerly an wind anomaly pattern, especially as we get into June, July. Of course, no one can believe a model 
two or three months out, but it sort of gives you a sense of what's to come. We'll over overlay the MJO, and of course, everything sort of makes sense looking at that. Active phase of the MJO is moving over the, actually here, there you go, you can see the date line. So Kelvin wave generation area right in between these two tick marks right about there. Okay, active phase of the MJO is these solid contours moving into the West Pacific and over the date line, oh, about the 18th, 19th of April. Makes perfect sense. Now, here's where things get interesting. Notice the inactive phase is forecast to set up in early May and continue into late May pretty strong. But notice, westerly wind anomalies are to continue, weaken a little bit here during this, the bulk of the, or the, the, the strongest part of the inactive phase of the MJO. Active phase moves back in, westerly anomalies build. This is all good for the jet stream. Really what we're doing here is setting ourselves up for the fall. Um, but here, let's take a look. Low pass filter. This suggests right now, here's our La Nina state in the atmosphere that is supposed to be gone come May 4th or 5th. And by about May 20th or so, a La Nina. Notice they switch. This is uh, the uh, uh, La Nina and El Nino pattern starts building in over the Kelvin wave generation area. If that's the case, then westerly anomalies dominate. The jet stream gets fed more, and we're into a pretty good pattern, theoretically, come fall. We'll see if that plays out. Let's take a look down in the ocean, and as we've said before, La Nina is dead in the ocean. We still see that to be the case. Again, West Pacific here, East Pacific here, actual water temperatures are look at, looking at. These are the, T, the anchor lines on the TA buoy array. Uh, the X's are sensors on the anchor line. Warm water here, 29, 28 degree Celsius, confined to the West Pacific, but a pretty good healthy flow of 24 to 26 degree anomalies. Uh, we saw this weeks ago, started b developing in the East Pacific. That continues to hold, looking pretty solid. Even some warmer anomalies starting to show up here in the far East Pacific. Look at anomalies, difference from normal for this time of year. We see a clearer pathway for warm water to migrate from the West Pacific to the East Pacific. We see two degree anomalies in the West Pacific. We also see... Uh, almost two degree anomalies in the east, far east Pacific. We're not saying this is necessarily a Kelvin wave flow, but just a path, a normal sort of path. Also notice two degree negative anomalies sitting at depth here. Oh, where is that? Somewhere around, though, south of Hawaii, 140, 150, something like that, uh, west. Um, no signs of it building upwards towards the surface. So we're basically ignoring this for now. If La Nina were in control, these anomalies would be up in here. Clearly not the case. Some sort of westerly anomaly or trades are suppressed mainly across this region. They're not suppressed, but weaker than normal, therefore allowing more warm water, ocean warming, less upwelling to occur, rise, raising surface temperatures in the ocean. Another model basically showing the same thing, though this shows cool anomalies blocking the path. So this is a kind of an interesting, is there really this blocking pattern going on, or is it deeper and warm water is actually making it over the surface? Unknown at this time. Upper ocean heat anomalies basically gives you sort of a sense of what's going on temperature-wise in the upper 300 meters of the ocean. Back in May a year ago, 2016, La Nina in effect, cool waters moving from west to east, and that continued into about the November time frame. Then we started the new year. That broke down. Steady, this warming pattern. If anything, this might have been a mini Kelvin wave here in the March time frame. Um, kind of not real obvious. Then perhaps a bit of the upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave generation cycle going on here. Maybe, maybe not. The pattern is very weak. It's hard to tell. But still, warm water clearly indicated was that one, two, three shades, one, two, three, one to one and a half degrees above normal here in the far east Pacific. It has to persist for three consecutive three month long periods before one can declare El Nino. That's clearly not the case. We are in what they call the spring unpredictability barrier right now that pretty much runs from March to 
uh, the end of May or so. So it's hard to tell whether El Nino or La Nina is in play or if, if it's developing, though our general thought for right now is, eh, this is kind of neutral for now. The warming's confined here. No clear signs of Kelvin waves, westerly wind bursts, anything that would, you know, the, the obvious signs of El Nino, but certainly nothing that is suggesting La Nina either. And one other piece of subsurface temperature data. Notice this we've been watching. This is uh, uh, Jason 2 satellite data. Sea level anomalies strip out all the winds, strip out all the waves, strip out the tides. You're looking for areas of enhanced or higher than normal sea levels that suggest warm water at depth. Warm water at depth, of course, expands. That creates a little bump on the ocean surface. And we know that there are warmer than normal waters here off of Peru and Ecuador, uh, moving over the Galapagos. This extended out at one point, I think, almost to 140 or 130, this little area of warm water. It sort of backed off a little, but still, you know, not bad. Certainly better than having cold water in this area, which would be an obvious sign of La Nina. That's not the case. This is not a clear sign of El Nino, but perhaps a sign of a return to a normal pattern. So let's take a look at ocean surface temperature data. Okay, obvious uh, thing that jumps out here, warming the normal water off of Ecuador, a little pocket here of, well, almost four degree anomalies, and then pockets in the two degree range, one and a half, out to a point, oh, almost the whole way to uh, 160 west, pushing towards the date line. The trend, though, look at this, cooler water here along Peru, all of Peru, down into Chile. This was nothing like this even three days ago. It was much more suppressed. This little cooler pocket's been building. That's not a bad sign. It's just this area, Nino 1.2 region, basically the area along the South American coast over the Galapagos, is very noisy. It can warm for a month or two. It can cool down depending on what the winds and trades are doing in this area. And that's not a definite sign that El Nino is going on. We've had a lot of warping here, uh, a lot of chatter about El Nino developing. Now things are kind of backing off a little bit. It cycles. Yeah. And again, most of this warm water, the Kelvin wave generation area doesn't start until you're west of here in the Nino uh, 3.4 region. The area for monitoring El Nino starts at 120 west and goes to 170 right in here. Yeah, there's some warming, but nothing significant. All the main activity is outside of the Nino 3.4 region, and it hasn't shown signs of clearly moving to the west either. It's sort of remained confined in this area here, so we're not jumping out of our seats going El Nino is developing yet. Seven-day trend in ocean temperatures clearly shows this blue down here. A lot of cooling here developing along Peru, especially off the Galapagos. Very much mirrors exactly what we saw in the other charts. A little bit of cooling out here. But over here in the Nino 3.4 region, 120 west to 170 west, eh, general warming appears to be setting in. This is a good sign. And the general overview temperatures. Yes, warming here uh, off of uh, Peru and off of uh, Ecuador. And then the Nino 3.4 region, this box right here, you can kind of draw a line and say, well, half of it's cool, half of it's warm. Kind of looks neutral. And this warm temperature here isn't strongly moving off into the Nino 3.4 region. It's pretty much confined here. We know there's not any strong westerly wind anomalies. We know there's not really any strong Kelvin wave activity going on. This smells much more like a case, and we've seen plenty of data that suggests what's happening here is trades are just weak in this area. Okay, If not westerly anomalies, that's prevented upwelling. That's prevented mixing. It's allowed the uh, sun to warm the temperatures here uh, a couple of degrees above normal. Yes, it's made lots of rain in Peru, and it all smells like El Nino, but none of the real mechanical stuff that you'd expect to see if an El Nino were developing is there. And the other thing is there's just not piles of warm water at depth here in the West Pacific. So even if you did get westerly anomalies, there's just not a big reservoir of warm water to start migrating east in the form of Kelvin waves. It's too soon after a major El Nino. You need four or five years 
of uh, of, of warm water buildup here before the uh, the atmosphere starts going. Hmm, something's not right, and for it to respond in the form of westerly winds and Kelvin waves and kick off the El Nino cycle. So for right now, pretty much a normal trend is occurring. So we go, okay, so the ocean doesn't look like uh, La Nina. It kind of looks like El Nino, but not really. What's the atmosphere doing? Is it responding to any of this, and how is it responding? So we look at the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. We see that the current value is 11.82. Positive numbers suggest La Nina. Negative numbers suggest El Nino. Well, we look over the past month and we see a lot more positive numbers than we do negative numbers. That suggests that some sort of weak La Nina is still in play in the atmosphere, still has the upper hand, at least looking at the daily picture. 30-day 30 30 average current value is 1.95. Zero would be neutral. If this was negative, then we could start saying some sort of El Nino is going on. But right now, looks pretty much like dead neutral. The 90-day running average... Now this runs a bit behind. Currently is trending a little bit negative, but only minus 1.33. If you're into El Nino territory, you want to be down in the minus 15 range, something like that. We're nowhere close to that. And you see this, you know, it was positive eh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's negative the same amount. So it's just trending around neutral per this index. Then there's one other index, the even more conservative one, the ESPI. Instead of measuring differences in pressure between the area north of Darwin, Australia, and off of Tahiti, it measures absolute rainfall. If you have more rainfall than normal here, that suggests El Nino. This is definitely sort of a lagging indicator. It means the atmosphere is already well changed into whatever pattern. Currently, the index is minus 1.06, so that means less precipitation here than normal. You can kind of see it here. Here's the rainfall anomalies for the last 30 days. A bit drier here than normal right in this box. So according to this, La Nina is still in effect in the atmosphere. And we believe that to be true from looking at all the other indexes and other data. And what we believe is happening, we're on the cusp in the next week or so of maybe La Nina finally just dying out. We'll get some westerly anomalies developing here. And as that happens, then pressures will start to drop and and you'll see more precipitation in here and then we'll move into a purely neutral state and then maybe trending towards La, uh, el nino as we move into the fall so we look at the cfs version 2 forecast for nino 3.4 region the area again for measuring or monitoring el nino la nina currently we're into april this suggests temperatures are yeah, you know, well, at 0.7 of a degree above normal. Let's go see if that's true. First, we'll look at temperatures in the Nino 1.2 region. They are falling almost dead neutral, minus, or, um, sorry, 0 0.213 degrees, basically neutral. This is the area, again, off of uh, South American coast and, uh, and uh, Ecuador. Nothing impressive here, but we do see that there was much warming in February and March, but now things are trickling down. But then we look at the Nino 3.4 region. Uh, per the model, we thought the temps that right now should be about, yeah, what do you say, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 above normal. At today's value, plus 0 0.405. And they haven't been any higher than that except in one little spurt back here in February. So that other model we were looking at is probably running a little bit on the hot side. Here it is here. We're right here. Should be plus 0 0.7 of a degree. Here's what it actually is, plus 0.4 of a degree. But we've always kind of expected this model was running a little bit on the hot side anyway. Anyway, looking at the forecast, you can see temperatures to build to about 0.9 of a degree, let's say early May, and then hang between there and 0.8 of degrees into, you know, yeah, almost October, and then maybe move up to plus 1.1 degrees. Other model data we've looked at suggests, again, that's a little bit high, that maybe 0.7 or 0.8 of a degree as we move into the fall. Now, El Nino is half a degree. So if we do even get above this line and it holds for, you know, whatever the, the three consecutive three-month periods, then we'd have a weak El Nino. But there's no sign of any strong El Nino coming out of this. Basically, for the fall and winter months, we'll say, Neutral, biased to the warm side if we get something better than that, great. But you know what? Neutral's better than La Nina. We'll take it any way we can get it. 
So wrapping it up, uh, basically small little swell move towards the, moving towards the U.S. West Coast. Maybe another system over the northern Dateline region making some more swell, but nothing huge, nothing large. Weather-wise for California, some snow in the Sierra, maybe midweek. You know, maybe a foot, something like that. And that's probably a little bit on the high side. Slowly, winter is fading out. Spring is taking over. All you have to do is look out your window to see that. Clearly the case, things are warming up. Uh, Southern Hemi trying to come online. Small swells, small storm activity. There's already, what, two small swells in the water moving this way. Perhaps more to come. Uh, we don't want to say goodbye to winter, but it wasn't a super productive winter. But we knew that going into this. It was a La Nina year. We knew we were kind of going to get burned surf-wise. The plus side was we got a lot of snow at select locations. That sort of made up for it if you're into snowboarding or skiing or any kind of snow mountain sports. Um, and the good news is little. there's plenty of snowpack. You can ski. Some resorts are saying in the Sierra, open till july or at least june we'll see uh i'm not planning my uh ski trip on the fourth of july just yet but it might be possible anyway that's it for this week we'll do it again next week same time same channel thanks for watching